So in this video, I thought I would talk about some ideas in time management that often I think don't get enough attention. And, and I think oftentimes people will make something like a to-do list and then they'll start tackling items one by one on that to-do list. And, and while this type of approach is better than simply finding different ways to procrastinate, and there are definitely, I think, a few dimensions uh, that, that I would encourage you to consider when you're planning out how to tackle what you need to get done. And, and for lack of a better term, I'm going to call this brain block or, or B squared scheduling. So two Bs, brain and block. So kind of BB. Brain block scheduling or B squared scheduling. And the idea behind that is that there's two particular dimensions I think you should consider when you're thinking about what you have to get done. There's kind of big brain versus small brain. And some tasks require a great deal of intensity and focus. And for example, if you're working on a math problem set or if you're working on a, a programming assignment for a computer science course, uh, versus other tasks are much more mechanistic. For example, you're organizing your desk and that, that's something that you can probably do with, with a little bit less mental energy, I would hope, than a math problem set. Uh, similarly, uh, some tasks are big block versus small block tasks. And so for example, some tasks are easier to accomplish if you have a big contiguous block of time. So for example, a programming assignment, or if you're working on a lengthy term paper, having uninterrupted time is valuable here because there's a high cost to switching contexts and, and perhaps even a higher startup cost since you know, what will often happen, at least when you're doing a programming assignment, is that you might have a lot of ideas in your head and you want to get those ideas down quickly before you uh, forget them. Or if you have to switch contexts, you might lose a lot of valuable information that you've been kind of keeping mentally track of as you're working. So in other words, the cost of getting interrupted is very high on these types of tasks. Okay, now other tasks might only require a few minutes. So for example, responding to a particular email or reading a short article that might be related to your work. And, and so these are things that you could probably do without quite, uh, you know, quite as much time, but they are going to be pretty important to work on. So let me actually talk about some examples. And let me actually use some of the... Uh, chalkboard here. I'm going to kind of draw out a big box here. Okay, let me yeah, just kind of break this up into make a little chart here. I'm in two columns and two rows. So, and we'll kind of break this up. So maybe across this dimension, I'll talk about a small brain And uh, big brain across the uh, across the columns. So everything here will be a big brain. Everything here will be small brain. And you might have big blocks. So let's say big block. So everything in this row will be big block and small block. Actually, let me make it a bit more consistent. I'll make it uh, small block on the top row. Second row. Right. So, what are some examples of tasks that would fall into these buckets? So, for example, um, you know, a big brain, big block task I mentioned might be, for example, a programming assignment that takes a lot of time, and you generally need a lot of mental focus when you're doing it. It's a programming assignment. Uh, what else could go in here? Maybe writing a term paper. You know, again, it'll require a certain amount of, of thought and effort uh, that's considerable. And also, uh, you're really going to be, you know, you want to spend a big chunk of time doing it. And really, what I mean here by term paper is not just, I'm really focusing on more of the writing phase, which I think requires more mental energy as compared to, let's say, editing or reviewing. So you really want to, your writing is something you might want to do in this kind of big brain, big block. You can think of it as big brain, big block activity. Uh, what are some small brain, small block, or rather small brain, yeah, let's talk about some small brain, small block activities. So for example, maybe reviewing lecture notes, you know, review notes. And by this, I don't mean like a real, you can be a cursory review, assuming that uh, you've already kind of gone over your notes and understood them better. Um, email, Facebook, um, you know, maybe napping, <laughs> taking a nap is a good activity. Uh, meditating, if you like to meditate. 
uh, etc. So these are some things that you might kind of fit in that small block, small brain category. Now, what about um, small brain, big block? So small brain, big block, some activities might include, you know, working out of the gym, so hitting the gym. Gym here. Um, what else? Um, uh, going out with friends, so hanging out with friends. Maybe that requires a couple hours. Just hanging out. Uh, the movies that requires also maybe at least a two to three hour investment. Uh, typically, you're not really using a lot of brain power, but uh, uh, these are the kinds of things that I can think of. Oh, sleeping. Certainly, if you want to sleep at night, you don't need much brain power to sleep, but you might. Ideally, need a nice good chunk of time to, to be able to, uh, to do that. And then what are some big brain small block activities? So maybe, again, this, this you can think of as, as uh, uh, let's see, um, maybe if you're doing one problem in a problem set, maybe part of a problem set. So you have the whole thing, but let's say you're doing part of a problem set. Um, Revising your lecture notes, that might not take you a lot of time, but I uh, certainly want to focus on that as you do it. Revising notes. Um, maybe reading an article, so reading something short. So these are the kinds of activities you might find yourself um, dividing your time among. Now what you'll, you'll also think about is the fact that there are times in the day when you're more mentally awake, you're mentally the most awake, and there are times in the day when you're not. For example, many people you know, are really awake between the hours of 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., and they're the most alert. Um, and maybe they're also alert in the evening, maybe between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. And, and keep in mind that having a high alertness level, um, you, you often find that maybe at multiple points in the day you'll have a high alertness level, and they may not correlate to when you woke up or when you go to sleep. Um, and in fact, I find that you know in the evening sometimes uh, I'm, I'm much more alert than I would be, let's say, right after lunch. Okay, uh, there's also a lot of research on alertness levels, and and I think that's kind of beyond the scope of this particular video. But it's something I would encourage you to look into uh, if it's of interest to you. So definitely dig in if if you're interested in, in thinking about alertness levels. You'll find a lot of good links online. Uh, and likewise, there are instances in the day when you have big chunks of time versus small chunks of time. For example. Maybe you have a one-hour break in between classes, right? And uh, you know that, that's not a ton of time to do a lot of stuff. Or maybe you have a few meetings during your day, but you have time in between meetings. Or perhaps there are days when you have a big chunk of time. Like maybe there's a day in which you only have one class the whole day. Uh, and ideally, what you want to be doing is you want to be scheduling big brain tasks during times when you're both fresh and have an appropriately sized block of time. Um, and Schedule small brain, small block tasks when you uh, have a small chunk of time and you're not as alert. For example, imagine that it's uh, you know it's 1 p.m. right after lunch and you've got a class at 2 p.m. You don't have a ton of time and being right after lunch, your brain is probably not at its most alert level. So you can go ahead and, and uh, it's a good time to schedule a small brain, small block task. Okay, now small brain, big block tasks, you should schedule them when you have a big chunk of time but maybe not as alert. Maybe uh, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. is a good time for a small brain, big block task. Uh, and if you have a, a big brain, big block task, you should schedule that when you're um, alert and have a lot of time. Or, or maybe if you, have a, if you have a big brain, small block task, you can, you can do that when you um, have a lot of time, but, uh, or don't have a lot of time, rather, but uh, maybe you have a lot of uh, mental energy. For example, you know, maybe this is something, so a big brain, small block task, maybe this is something that you could try to do around be 10 30. Let's say you have, you're meeting friends for lunch at 11 30 and, and you only have an hour. It's a good time to do that um, as an example. Now I think opportunities when you have both a big chunk of time and you are the most mentally alert, that should be especially sacrosanct. I mean do not waste those opportunities because they don't come frequently down the day. And this is kind of the where you want to fit your your big brain, big chunk task. This is like the most important part of your day. This should be sacrosanct. Okay, sacred. Don't don't mess with that time if you can. Okay, try not to schedule small brain, small block tasks in there. And I often see students do this. I mean they'll they'll make mistakes where they'll, 
you know, maybe they'll do some light reading for a class or they'll scour Facebook from you know, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. when they're actually relatively alert, and then they'll start their math homework at 11 p.m. when they're tired. And if they had done things the other way around, let's say start their math homework first, um, it would have been far more optimal from a learning perspective. And, you know, I also really recognize, I mean, this is, you know, and I kind of stress this here, it's really hard to always accomplish this. So I say ideally you should try to accomplish this. It's not something you may always be able to do. Okay, and the, I really do mean the ideal part. Um, the reality is that uh, you, know, you have many constraints in your life and you can't always schedule in an ideal fashion. But at the same time, if you're at least cognizant of these dimensions, such as the amount of contiguous time required and the amount of mental alertness required, then you can at least improve your scheduling of these tasks and, and get to a more effective schedule. Uh, you could also try to plan any other engagements. Like for example, if you have meetings or you're planning to have coffee with your friends, etc., you can do that in a way that doesn't occur during otherwise big brain, big chunk periods. And overall, you should try to keep these factors in mind and try to account for them when you're planning out your work. Now, to be honest, I don't think I've been perfect at this myself. Um, there have been many situations in which I've benefited, though, from this type of approach. Even though I haven't always been able to use it, when I have used it, it's been very powerful. And one time when I used it, I remember very clearly, was when I was writing my PhD thesis. And I made it a point during that period of time to get to my office really early in the morning before actually anybody else was there. And I focused primarily on the actual writing piece. And the emphasis was on actual writing, which I thought of as a big brain task. And actually, you know, this was more, I was focusing more on the writing than the actual, let's say, reviewing or editing or revising, embellishing, which I felt could be done with less mental energy or, or less, uh, with maybe a smaller chunk of time. Uh, whereas I think the actual core writing is something that required kind of brain power and a big chunk of time. And I would find that I could easily get three to four hours of very solid writing before the office got too noisy and, and too difficult to really write in. And then what I would do in general is I would carry around the draft of my chapters of my thesis with me. And then when I had a few moments here and there, you know, for example, let's say I was waiting before a class or, or, or what have you, I could mark up potential edits or think of things to add. Uh, sometimes I might, for example, if I had like a half an hour in between things, I might go to my computer, create a diagram for something that I already had mentally envisioned, but I hadn't actually written the diagram out for. And in that way, I was actually able to finish writing my thesis in a lot less time than I've seen other people take for doing the same kind of task. And it really just was a matter of scheduling my time appropriately. So in general, I think thinking about and really being cognizant of the level of mental intensity and the amount of time you have um, in general, and, and really the mental intensity and the, the amount of time required for particular tasks should play an important role in how you schedule them. So really think about this type of B-squared brain block scheduling when you're trying to tackle how to get things done. So I'm going to stop right there. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I look forward to making some more for you.